How far would you go for duty and honor? Or let's put it more realistically, for your job. This is the story of Louis XIV's chef who killed himself over a delayed delivery of fish. Hi, I am Reema and this is Historia Maxima, where we talk about history, its wonderful stories and the lessons it could possibly teach us. For the life and times of Louis XIV, France's Sun King, while many sources of primary information are available, among the best ones are the letters that people wrote to their friends and family members. These letters are obviously of a personal nature, describing life and court politics in such intimate detail that is hard to find in any other, more official sources of the time. One such letter is the one that Marquise de Sévigne wrote in April of 16. 71 to her daughter Françoise Marguerite. In this letter, she tells her daughter about a party she was at where the chef killed himself because of a delayed delivery of fish which had ruined the dining plans he had laid out for his master's guests, which included the king. Louis XIV himself. Before we read the letter, let's go back 10 years further into the past to 1661 when Nicolas Fouquet, superintendent of finances for Louis XIV, threw a party at his new home, vaux le vicomte The party that Nicolas Fouquet had hosted and especially the feast at this party is said to be one of the top three to four celebrations in the entire history of France. From the fireworks to the waterworks in the magnificent mile-long gardens of Fouquet's residence to the feast which was served on plates of solid gold and silver with 30 dishes on the menu. This party was so magnificent that two things happened. First, Louis XIV got so jealous of Fouquet that he had him arrested on charges of financial misconduct. And second, he hired the same team of architects who built Fouquet's home to build him the Palace of Versailles. But that's not what I want to talk about. It's what goes on behind the scenes. When we hear about such events, we are too enamored, too enraptured by the mesmerizing details of the perfect fireworks, the fountains cascading in perfect harmony over mile-long gardens, the feast that was not just the very best in every way, but served to the country's most important people in absolute perfection. And we hardly ever give a thought to what happens behind the scenes, behind the curtains, that made such larger-than-life splendor even possible for the aristocrats. What we don't think about, even for a moment, is that it takes hundreds upon hundreds of servants to work tirelessly for weeks, even months, to make one such night of a spectacular party possible. From the cleaning maids who scrub every inch of surface, to the washerwomen who washed every curtain, every piece of dining linen and footmen's uniforms, to the stable lads who made sure enough space and refreshment was available to every carriage and horse that came in carrying France's top nobility, to the kitchen maids who scrubbed and wiped every piece of expensive cutlery, and of course, the cooks who ensured delivery of every raw ingredient down to the last onion needed to make the perfect roasts and sauces matching with the right wine and making sure there's enough of those at the right temperature at the right time of serving. To really understand this with a better perspective, just think about what it's like when you have to make a group presentation at work. If that is difficult, slow and frustrating, now you can understand the extraordinariness of such parties and events in the 17th century. It took an incredible amount of work by that faceless, nameless team to make these things come together, especially in times without any electricity or phones or emails. One of the toughest jobs, arguably, was of the head chef the man in charge of planning the meals, 
arranging the raw ingredients, making sure the quantities were accurate and the delivery was on time such that the ingredients were fresh and there's enough to cook and serve them before they went bad. Remember, no fridge or microwave and arranging the meals on every table in perfection. For Fouquet, that chef was Francois Vatel and a tremendous job he did. Ten years later, the letter that Marquise de Sévigné wrote to her daughter was concerning this very chef, Francois Vatel. By now, in 1671, Vatel was employed at the Château de Chantilly, the residence of Louis of Bourbon, also known as Le Grand Condé, who was a military hero of France and of royal blood. He was the highest ranking aristocrat in France after the king himself. In April 1671, Le Condé, Vatel's boss, invited Louis XIV to his Château de Chantilly for a three-day visit. Hosting the king of France was, of course, a grand event possibly the grandest possible, and Vatel could not cause any disappointment, Le Condé or the King of France. 2,000 guests were in attendance. Clearly, the pressure on Vatel was enormous. Just how enormous? We can see when Madame de Sévigné's letter describes how Vatel hadn't slept for 12 nights and that his head was turning around. On the first night of the King's three-day visit, there wasn't enough roast meat for two of the 60 tables, and Vatel Vatel was very distraught about it all night. Madame de Savigny wrote in her letter, quote, They had dinner, but there wasn't enough roast. Vatel felt he had disgraced himself. Le Condé walked to Vatel's room and said, All is well. Nothing was more beautiful than the king's supper. Vatel answered, Your Highness, your kindness overwhelms me. I know that roast was missing at two tables. Don't get angry, all's going well, said Le Condé. End quote. The letter goes on to tell us, quote, At midnight, time came for the fireworks. The display was not successful. A cloud blinded the sight. It had cost 16,000 francs. At four in the morning, Vatel started wandering everywhere. Everybody was asleep. Vatel met a young purveyor bringing in two loads of fish. Vatel asked, Is that all? Vatel's head was getting hot. He found Gourville and told him, Sir, I will not survive this affront. Gourville made fun of him. Vatel went up to his room, attached his sword to a door and ran it through his body three times before he died, which is the very moment the fish started arriving. Everyone was looking for Vatel so the fish could be distributed. They went to his room, knocked on the door and then forced it open, only to find Vatel drowning in his own blood. They ran to Le Condé, who was desperate. Le Condé wept. He told the king sadly that this had happened because of Vatel's idea of honor. Vatel was praised, but his courage was blamed." End quote. Louis XIV went on to say that he had waited five years before travelling to Chantilly. He was afraid there would be too much of a fuss. If you're wondering how the guests at the party reacted to Vatel's death, Here's what happened. The party went on. The celebrations continued for the next two days. Despite it coming from a primary source, we can't be sure how true this story is. It could perhaps be just gossip, something that would not be so out of place in a mother's letter to a daughter. But the fact remains that Vatel did die that night in April 1671. What it does point to is the culture of fear that pervaded in society back then. It still is now, it just looks different. But fear has and always will be a priceless tool for control, for keeping people in line. Beautifully masked by ideas like honor and courage, it is fear that has driven us to do truly fearful things to other humans and ourselves.